I'm gonna walk down that hallway toward the door. I, I bet there's something cool behind it. I doubt it. Okay, yeah, you, you begin walking down the hallway and then you're dead. Wait, what? I, 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 I died? <laughs> I told you so. Yeah, there, there was a trap in the hallway. Holy crap, really? Yeah, no kidding. Where was the description of the trap? I don't know, it was a trap. Does it really matter how it works? Well, of course it does, you simple-minded buffoon. Yeah, what, what dungeon master school did you graduate from anyway? Yeah, Fat Cat could design and run a trap better than you. Listen, you guys, the barbarian is dead, okay? Now, can we just keep playing this game? Well, he's not the only one who's going to be dead. You know what time it is, boys? Uh, stabby, stabby time? No. There has been something highly irregular about Gary the Intern for quite some time, but I can't quite put my finger on it. I, I told you all before, Gary's voice sounds just like the rose. No, that's not it. But I agree with the wizard. Something is going on here. I know what it is. It's another one of the Dungeon Master's invisible but deadly traps. I knew it. Our illustrious Dungeon Master cheating yet again. No, that's not it, you guys. Why, why won't anyone <laughs> listen to me? Welcome to the DM Lair. I'm Luke Hart and I've been a Dungeon Master since high school. On this channel, I give practical Dungeon Master advice that you can use in your Dungeons and Dragons games. Today in the Lair, we're gonna be talking about traps in D&D. Specifically, we'll discuss the basics of how traps work and how to create traps for your own D&D games. Then, on this Friday's live stream over on Twitch, I will be creating traps if you want to swing on by and see firsthand how the process works. Trying to do a video here. <laughs> Little guy. Little guy, he wants to be on camera. What are you doing? I don't want my kisses. Whoa, little guy. <laughs> Before we jump in, I want to let you know that I recently overhauled how my Patreon works. Now, my patrons will be receiving monthly PDFs chock full of Dungeon Master resources such as adventure ideas, magic items, pre-made encounters, traps, new monsters, and even entire D&D adventures. That's on top of other benefits such as access to a patron-only Discord channel, voting on videos I make, getting access to the homebrew adventures and notes that I use in my own personal D&D games and even playing D&D with me. So if that sounds like something you might like, there is a link to my Patreon page left conveniently below. All right, let's do this. Traps. Part one, how traps work. One wrong step in an ancient tome triggers bellows hidden behind the wall to expel a deadly poisonous gas into the corridor. Inadvertently stumbling over a tripwire causes the beams to either side of the corridor to fall, collapsing the ceiling on top of you. Traps can be found almost anywhere in a D&D game and are a time-honored tradition. I usually try to include at least one trap in all the D&D adventures I create. Triggers! The first thing that all traps have in common is a trigger. You see, traps lie dormant in the dungeon or other location where an adventure takes place until brave adventurers or foolhardy townsfolk come one wandering through. And the job of a trigger is to carry that trap from its inactive waiting state to its hello, I am here, and I'm about to kill you state. Typical trap triggers are pressure plates on the floor, trip wires strung across the hallway, magical proximity detectors, or opening something such as a door or container. Basically, traps are triggered when a creature goes somewhere or touches something the trap's creator wanted to protect. Effects. When a trap is triggered, there is of course an effect, something horrible that happens to the poor sap who set the trap off, or his friends all around him too. The effects of a trap can range from inconvenience convenient to deadly, and can make use of elements such as arrows, spikes, blades, poison, toxic gas, blasts of fire, and deep pits. And if you want to get particularly nasty, combine multiple elements to kill, injure, contain, or drive off the moron dumb enough to trigger the trap. Am I calling on my players morons? So let's say that you have a pit that characters fall into, taking damage as they land at the bottom. Then a pressure plate triggers a lid to close on the pit, trapping them inside. Then poisonous gas seeps from the walls of the pit, putting the character into a deep slumber. Next, the pit begins to fill with water, causing the character to drown and die. I've never run that particular trap, but it sounds a lot, a lot of fun. That might show up in one of my games here. 
Detecting traps. Smart adventurers, or wise ones that have learned from prior bad experiences, will keep their eyes out for traps as they move through a dungeon or other adventure location. A player can have their character look for traps by making a wisdom perception check opposed by the DC that you, the dungeon master, set for spotting the trap. I usually have the DC be between 13 and 20 based on how well hidden the trap is and the level of the adventure. In the case of magical traps such as Glyph of Warding, the spell Detect Magic can be used to find the trap. Of course, of course, a perception check might also help the character spot the runes of magic carved onto a surface as well. Okay, and if you're wondering if characters can find traps using their passive perception, so they don't have to actively declare they're looking for a trap, I'll delve into my thoughts on that a little bit later. Understanding traps. So spotting a trap only tells the characters that there is a pressure plate, tripwire, or other triggering mechanism. It doesn't tell them what the trap actually is or does. In order to figure out what the nature of the trap is, scythe blades, poison dart, jet of fire, a character makes an intelligence investigation check to determine exactly what the trap is and how it functions. Again, the dungeon master sets the difficulty class for this check, and I usually keep it between 13 and 20, just like the DC for detecting traps. Really? Why don't you come over here then? This guy's really bothering me today. Come here, you little... Oh. <laughs> this is little guy. He... Wants attention. You are such a butthead. He's being loud. I'm trying to make a video. Now you're famous. You're on You're on YouTube. This is a little guy. I'm small. Yeah, get out of here, small. He's the smallest cat we have. Hey, it's YouTube. People love cats, right? Disabling a trap. Once the brave and hardy adventurers have found a vicious trap in their path, they will most likely want to disable it or otherwise bypass the trap. Unless, of course, there is a barbarian in the group and then they might just decide to take it in the face because, well, that's how barbarians detect and disable traps in D&D. If they were successful in finding the trigger, bypassing the trap might be as simple as jumping over a pressure plate, for instance, and thus not triggering the trap at all. If they were successful in understanding how the trap works, for example, poisonous gas that is expelled from two tubes in the walls, they might do something like packing the tubes tightly with rags so that the poisonous gas can't get out. My, my point here is that oftentimes players' creativity can allow them to either bypass or disable a trap. Thieves' tools are not the only way to disable traps. However, one way that adventurers can also deal with traps, especially rogues, is through the use of the aforementioned thieves tools. Basically, once a character has found the trigger for the trap, they can attempt to disable that trigger. And of course, once the trigger has been fouled, there is nothing to cause the trap's effects, and it is now safe. To disable a trap with thieves tools, a character makes a dexterity thieves tools check opposed by the difficulty class that the dungeon master sets. And once again, I've found that a DC between 13 and 20 works fairly well, well the whole thing in Dungeons and Dragons 5th edition called Bounded Accuracy. Yeah. But by the way, the DCs I've been mentioning thus far are general guidelines. I'll get into more specifics based on party level in just a bit. But what about disabling magical traps? It, in most cases, it takes magic to disable magic traps. In particular, casting Dispel Magic on a magical trap is usually the way to go. Since Dispel Magic is a third level spell, I would rule that any magic trap based on a level three or lower spell would simply be disabled by the casting of that spell. For high level spell traps, the character would need to make a spell casting ability check as described in the Dispel a magic spell to see if the magical trap is disabled or not. Sometimes too, I'll rule that Dispel Magic only suppresses the trap for a certain amount of time, perhaps 10 minutes or so. It depends on the nature of the magical trap, how powerful it is, and how powerful the creature or spellcaster is who created it. Part two, creating a trap. Now, there are two different categories of traps, simple and complex. A simple trap has effects that are resolved instantaneously when the trap is triggered. For instance, a character steps on a pressure plate and spikes spring out of the wall. It's a very original trap, by the way. When a complex trap is triggered, all the characters roll initiative. Different aspects of the trap have their own initiatives, and what happens is resolved in rounds. An example of a complex trap is the garbage chute trap, or the trash compactor trap, in Star Wars Episode IV, A New Hope. The heroes find themselves trapped in a trash compactor whose walls are slowly closing in. The heroes are then trying to stop the walls while also finding a way out. Midway through the trap, another effect of the trap reveals itself and a monster pulls Luke under the water in the trash compactor. 
Then the heroes have to save him while continuing to slow the walls down and search for a way out. Now, now today I'm just going to be discussing simple traps. We're going to leave creating complex traps for another day. Step one, determine the purpose of the trap. Why does the trap exist? Is it there to simply sound an alarm? Should it delay intruders until guards can respond to their presence? Perhaps the trap restrains them. Or like many fine traps in D&D, perhaps the trap is there to harm, maim, and murder the plucky adventurers who would dare trespass in parts unknown. Step two, determine the type of trap. Is this a mechanical trap that relies on gears and other mundane mechanisms to trigger and deploy its effects? Or is it a magical trap that relies on, well, magic? Step three, determine the level and severity of the trap. In this step, you decide what level of party the trap is designed for and how deadly the trap will be, also called its severity. Essentially, the attack bonus of a trap, the save DC to resist its effects, and the damage it deals can vary depending on the trap's severity and the level for which it is designed. I recommend that you use the chart on page 116 of Xanathar's Guide to Everything when deciding upon these elements. And if you don't have Xanathar's, page 121 of the Dungeon Master's Guide also has a chart on it you can use, but the chart in Xanathar's is better. It's like they, they went back and they're just like, hmm, how can we repurpose this content and make it a, just a little bit better? It's actually better. In fact, Xanathar's, the entire section of traps revisited in Xanathar's is very, very good. For instance, referencing the chart, if I'm going for a dangerous trap, then I'll set the DC for the saving throw and ability checks somewhere around 15. If the trap uses an attack bonus, it'll have roughly a plus eight to attack. And if the trap is designed for levels five through 10, I'll have the damage average somewhere around 22. There is also a chart in Xanathar's that gives you guidelines on which level spells to use in traps depending on the party's level and the severity you're going for. For example, if I want a dangerous magical trap for my level five to 10 party, I would use a third level spell for that trap, such as Fireball. Of course, it's gonna be Fireball. It's, it's like one of the best damage dealing spells in the entire game. The one thing, however, that is not well represented in these charts is how saving throws and difficulty classes for ability checks should scale with level. For instance, if I create a moderate severity trap for my level 20 party, but use the saving throw DC of 10 suggested in the charts, it would be an absolute joke. Very few characters would ever come close to failing a DC 10 saving throw at higher levels. Like, not even close. So, my suggestion is to bump up the saving throw DCs, attack bonuses, and spell check DCs of traps based on the level the trap is designed for. You can see here the modified chart that I use, and I feel this works better for traps at higher levels. In a nutshell, for levels 11 through 16, I would increase the saving throw DC, attack bonuses, and skill check DCs by three. And then for levels 17 through 20, I would increase them all by another two points. Of, of course, don't forget that as the dungeon master, you can tweak these numbers as desired for your own groups. For instance, I sometimes decide that the DC for finding a trap might be fairly high, but once they find it, disabling it isn't too hard or vice versa. Step four, determine what triggers the trap. This step is fairly straightforward. Simply decide what sets the trap off. I've given some examples of triggers already, but your imagination is the only limit on what a trigger could be. Number five, determine the effects of the trap. Do spikes spring out of the ground? Very original, as I've mentioned before. Do poisonous darts fly from the walls? Does acid spray from the mouth of a statue nearby? Again, the effects are limited only by your creativity. When you're determining the effects of a trap, this is when you're going to decide what the saving throw DC or the trap's attack bonus is based on the charts we went over in step three. If the trap causes damage, you'll decide what that is too, again, using those same charts. Step six, determine countermeasures for the trap. In this step, you decide several things, how characters are able to detect the trap, how they can determine what the trap does and how it works, and how they can disable or bypass the trap. And when determining the DC is needed to do any of these things, you'll once again reference the charts we discussed in step three. They're very handy, these charts, you'll see. Okay, as an example to illustrate what I mean here, let's say that when someone steps on a pressure plate, spikes come out of the wall. <laughs> how many times am I gonna use spikes out of the wall as an example? just to prove my point that it's not original. Not that all traps have to be original. I mean, tried and true is tried and true, and there's a reason people use things over and over again. Like, if you're gonna punch, oh, let's not talk about punching people in the face. But if you were, the nose is a good target. You don't have to pick an original target. It's a good place to punch. It's probably not an appropriate example.
Oh well. The first countermeasure to determine is that for detecting the trap. If a character searches the hallway, they can make a wisdom perception check with a DC of 15. If they succeed, they notice the pressure plate. Now you create the countermeasure for figuring out what the trap does. If a character studies the pressure plate, they can make an intelligence investigation check with a DC of 13, let's say. If they succeed, they notice holes in the wall nearby, concealed behind some moss, what appears to be spikes within the holes, and then deduce that stepping on the pressure plate causes the spikes to shoot out. The final countermeasure is for disabling the trap. You could say that someone who uses thieves tools and succeeds on a DC 15 dexterity thieves tools check disables the pressure plate mechanism. You might also note that the pressure plate isn't that big and can simply be jumped over. Of course, on the other side of that pressure plate is another pressure plate they didn't see. See, that's, that's, that's how you make traps. Step seven, determine where to place the trap. Where to place the trap is extremely important. Remember, bad guys don't go to all the work of making a trap just for the fun of it. Thus, they're going to place the traps in locations where they will be the most effective. Choke points in the dungeon where intruders must pass through to go any further into the dungeon are good spots. This ensures that they only need one trap and not multiple traps to protect various entry points. Traps will also be placed near places or objects their creators are trying to protect. If you want to protect the treasure in a room, put the trap on the door. Some Something important in the chest, well, the trap is probably on the chest itself or on the wall next to the chest. Don't forget to follow me over on Twitch where I answer your Dungeon Master questions and this Friday we'll be creating traps together. Let me know about the nastiest trap you've ever encountered in the comments. Next week I'll be discussing my top tips for running traps in D&D, but until then click right here to learn how to create a D&D adventure. And until next time, let's play D&D.